Um, I, I didn't really know what this meeting was going to be about, and two weeks ago I had to kind of figure out what the heck I was going to say, and I'm going to approach this a little bit differently than some of the others. So first I want to talk about a few issues that, does this thing work? Is this the thing yeah. that makes it work? <laughs> okay. <laughs> Sorry, David took me to Argentina, and on the way back, somebody coughed the whole way, and I got COVID for the first time after four years. And I'm now over it, but I'm still coughing. Um, so I want to show you a few examples of what has happened in the climate change arena and then talk a little bit about the inevitability of more climate change and some possible directions and, and actions. So let me find this thing. So the first one, I think that was the first slide, yes. The first one is to take a look at what the climate record has been. And now, all nine of the warmest years we've ever seen happened since 2014. Um, 2022 was the 46th year in a row we were above the 20th century average. And um, I put two pictures here. The top one is from NOAA and shows which years are El Nino, which years are La Nina, which years are neutral. The red ones are El Nino years. The, and notice we've been cooler the last couple years, but that's be, because we've had La Nina, which is called the cold phase of the ocean. This year is an El Nino year, and you've seen the news coverage in the last week or two about the hottest day ever in the hottest uh, months. I've been saying for six months, if this is going to be El Nino, we'll probably set an all-time heat record this year. We haven't so far, we're in third place up through, I think, the end of May. Um, but the time the El Nino really is going to hit us is, is about now. Now, coupled with that, it has been getting hotter, but this is a picture of billion dollar disasters in the United States. And they're mostly climate related. The only thing I'll say about this is Notice the fairly strong upward trend there. Again, we've, this is the eighth year in a row with more than 10 of these billion dollar um, plus events. And we've probably had one with the Canadian fires this year. Um, <clears throat> we're likely to have that. The bottom graph shows a little bit about global drought incidents. And notice up until about 1970, or 1980 or so, we had the incidence of severe and extreme drought down a little lower than they have been more recently. So there has been more drought in, in recent times, and that's the percentage of the Earth's surface under those more extreme drought conditions. Then finally, I thought Kathy would be here and talk about water, but I'll just throw a couple of water slides up. Um, the top slide is the Edwards Aquifer, which is an area that San Antonio gets its water from. It's a little bit west of San Antonio, Texas. Well, you can see in that picture that up until, I think that was about 1975, the recharge trend in that area was increasing. Since 75, it appears to have been decreasing. So we're, that, that's caused San Antonio to have to change its water policies and where it gets its water from, and it spent billions of dollars investing in getting water from other locations. Then finally, this is a flooding incidents picture. And notice that we have differential flooding incidents here um, up here in the more northern areas and in the northeast, we've seen a bunch more flooding. You've heard about Vermont the last few days. Up here in the Red River area, I think they had three 500-year floods in a 10-year period. Um, in Houston, they've had big floods. 
So climate change is certainly altering water availability and its probability distribution. Then finally, there's been a lot of talk about, well, I keep saying finally, but there's been a lot of talk about tech, TFP. Um, I just want to talk about corn yields. This is a picture of what corn yields have done between 1950 and I think 2022 is the last data we have in this. It might be 2021. Um, I guess it is 2022. And <clears throat> if you take a long-term regression, you get about a 1.96 bushel a year increase. I know the USDA ERS people used to tell me two bushels per year is what the corn increase has been. Well, if you decompose that series, you get 2.6 almost up until about 73, and about 1.9 between 75 and 2011, and then a little less than one bushel since then. Now, clearly, this is not entirely a climate change phenomena, but we've tried to do some econometrics to unravel the two, and it's clearly part research investment, and also it's part um, climate change issues. So, um, <clears throat> oh, I try to put, I own one of these, and I'm used to using it. Um, the other thing I want to talk a little bit about is movements that are going on in agriculture. This is where corn was grown in 1975 in the U.S. Notice, not so much here in the Dakotas, not so much here in, in eastern Nebraska. By 2020, notice now we've got some in the Dakotas, <coughs> additional stuff up here in Minnesota. Um, <coughs> we had some corn here. We don't have any corn much being reported down there. So what we've seen is a northward and westward shift in what's going on. North gets cooler, west gets more elevation in general, so that's also a move toward cooler. Um, we've, we looked at other hay, and it doesn't show up very well here, but notice there was hardly any other hay reported here, and now there's quite a bit, so it kind of has moved in behind the corn. Um, so have some other crops, but in general, this shows that we are having a movement in where we produce things. And this is a wheat picture that shows at the same time that the corn was pushing in, the wheat is pushing out. Now, I've been trying to get Canadian data for this to try to take a look at what's going on in Canada, but if somebody has a bunch of Canadian data, I need some help. It's all controlled at the province level. They don't have nice ERS centralized data systems. Um, <clears throat> so the last point I want to make is that there is something else going on, which is carbon dioxide. We did an econometric analysis on what yields would be with and without the carbon dioxide effect. And basically, the only point I'll make is that about a 40% of the yield increase that we've seen in cotton has been due to carbon dioxide. And the same is true for rice. I don't have that picture here, but it's... Those two crops are greatly stimulated by carbon dioxide. Wheat is a little bit. Um, most of the rest of the crops only get drought relief under carbon dioxide. So that's the climate change effects. That's kind of the background of what we might need policy for. However, that's what, those are data of what we have seen happen so far, not what would happen with more climate change. Now, between today and 2040 or 2050, this is the IPCC picture of what they project the future climate is going to be. These different colored lines are different amounts of carbon or, or emissions control. This red one here is what we used to call business as usual which is what's going to happen if we keep going on the path we are without any real climate mitigation. The, there's one in here that is, this Paris Accord is about the, 
this one right here. So the Paris Agreement is going to drop us from going up to five and a half degrees to down to about four degrees by the end of the century. These bottom two I've always called as invented in Disneyland. They're the ones that say we stop all emissions right now. So realistically, the real domain is in here. But between now and 2040, it doesn't matter. We get about one degree of additional climate change, as much as we've seen in the last century, all within the next 25 years. So those effects I was showing you are probably likely to accelerate. Um, more billion dollar disasters, maybe a greater slowdown in corn productivity. I don't agree with the people who say corn yields are going to decrease. I think it's really the rate of gain in the corn yields that are going to decrease. So what can we do in the, fa in the face of this? Well, we can, um, when, when the Kyoto Accord was around and being discussed in the U.S. government, they said, we don't know enough about climate change, we're going to wait for more information. Well, that's clearly one of the things you can do, is build more information um, that's likely to have higher impact costs. You can reduce the drivers of climate change. This is where we talk about carbon control and methane and nitrous oxide. Also, they talk about putting reflective surfaces in the atmosphere to stop the sun's rays from coming in. So there are some actions on that side. And then finally, adaptation. Rich said for a while ago that adaptation wasn't yield increasing. Adaptation is fundamentally yield increasing. It's, it's designed to make our systems produce better but not affect the degree of climate change whatsoever. So this is moving crops to different areas, new varieties, um, drought tolerance, and all that kind of stuff. It, it does slow down our rate of technical progress. It does not necessarily make crop yields go negative, especially when you put in adaptations like move the corn, take it out of the southern parts, and move it up into the north. Um, OK, so what I, I want to talk a little bit about <clears throat> is some of the big policy and public good actions that can go on here. Um, we can help with policy to manage lower technical progress rates. I haven't demonstrated this, but if you look at that Edwards Aquifer graph I had, it, was, um, it had a bigger variance in the later time periods and the earlier time periods, and the same thing seems to be true in crop yields. So we have managed an increased vulnerability, and then helping to manage our <coughs> adaptation, then helping avoid future climate change, that's on the mitigation side, through emission reductions, creating emission offsets, which is what some of the bioenergy ideas are about, and increasing sequestration. Now, um, <coughs> in terms of what these things are in managing lower technical progress rates, we can increase R&D spending. We can direct more money to production enhancement, direct more money to adaptation. Notice when we do put money on adaptation and or we put money on mitigation, then to some extent we're, we're moving away from production enhancement. What adaptation's probably more about is maintaining the yields in Tippecanoe County, Indiana, as opposed to necessarily enhancing the yields in Tippecanoe County, Indiana. So there, the yields will be higher in the future than they would have been otherwise, but we're sacrificing some of the money we spend on, on what we do traditionally to enhance fertilizer efficiency or whatever it might be. Um, <coughs> Similarly, on mitigation, right now the Inflation Recovery Act has, what, $18 billion to be spent on USDA programs. I think some of that's going to bleed into research. Well, that's work. We, it, it's not necessarily productivity enhancing. It's just showing ways that we can reduce the 
the greenhouse gases coming out of agriculture. And so that both of those funding sources, to some extent, dilute the money that goes into strict productivity. And the earlier picture Gao had was also showing more money going into marketing and environmental issues and a lot of non-productivity related issues. Um, we probably, we might need better policy to get a better reception for GMOs. We may let private efforts champion some of the production. In the US, I don't think Keith is here, but in the US, the public and private R&D investments are fairly close to level. They had different results than what Alston and Pardee were showing. Um, <clears throat> but the private is taking on an ever-increasing role. The public role is slipping down. The private probably is doing more on production. The public is probably doing more on some of these other items. Um, and so we may need to supplement private investment in underexplored areas. I don't think there's so much private investment into to increasing some of the minor crops. It tends to be more on the major crops and major livestock items. Okay. Um, <clears throat> in managing increased v variability, there's work on drought, heat, and pest resistant varieties. There's marketing channels. <coughs> We may need to improve marketing channels for things we already know how to do but aren't so good at the moment. Brahmin cattle are light colored, they're more, uh, more tolerant of heat, but I don't know anything about this, somebody here probably does, but somebody told me the big hump in the back doesn't fit in the boxes that people want to ship meat around in. Plus, they're they're not as tasty as Angus. So we may need some work on marketing channels there. We may need some work on GMOs. We may, may need broader scoped insurance. We may need to do more trend adjustment to reflect the fact that climate change is making returns walk and maybe more on extremes coverage. Um, we also probably need a lot of extension work on on how, what kind of things you can do to better um, make your land use less vulnerable, cropping and livestock systems, and what to do as pests come in. Um, on managing adaptation, there's a number of different adaptation things. There's obviously research extension and capital investment. We can spend money on irrigation, improving that, um, drought resistant varieties more tolerant breeds and varieties that can deal with hotter conditions or more drought. On the crop and livestock mix, promote that, the rotation age, and ultimately on some land abandonment issues. Um, adaptation in itself, when we're thinking about policy design, there's kind of three flavors of adaptation. There's, are, is my fish in this particular place going to survive? I, I remember listening to a woman who was working in California who was an ecologist saying she was tempted to get out the butterfly net, capture a bunch of butterflies, drive them 100 miles that way, and let them loose. I mean, that's kind of the natural adaptation, but we may interfere in that. There's autonomous adaptation. We don't necessarily have to pay farmers to adapt better to adopt corn and move out wheat, because they're probably going to figure that out on their own. Um, the, and then there's planned adaptation, which is an adaptation by governments to address public good sorts of things. This is the literature according to IPCC. I, I, the first one's natural. The autonomous is more a private good where an individual can change their operations in their own best interests. And then the final one is addressing public goods. We may well need to support autonomous adaptation by developing new varieties and giving information on what people can use. We may have to act directly with R&D, carrying out projects, building irrigation, 
developing strategies, and we may eventually have to manage the unmanaged, where if you want the polar bears to survive, maybe we build them a bunch of oil drum floats and put them out so they can swim to them. I've never, <laughs> I don't know if that's even possible, but what the heck. Um, there is a big issue with adaptation in the treadmill. This climate change is kind of a continual slow moving bull bulldozer that's making things hotter and hotter. If you go in and you fix the climate change um, issue in Tippecanoe County, um, Indiana, where I used to work and so did these guys, then you can't just rest on your laurels and say it's done. You're probably going to have to adapt that five years down the road and another five years down the road. It's a little bit like the pest management business. We used to We'd apply pesticides, and there was this thing called the brown plant hopper where it had six generations a year, and the first time you sprayed them, half of them would die, and then the next time, less than that would die, and the final one said, I need you to wash me off, come out and give me some of that stuff. And as a consequence, we had to keep investing on improving our pest management things Climate change is going to be the same kind of thing. We're going to have to have continual investment. Um, <clears throat> so then, then there's a whole bunch of mitigation policies. I didn't think that the regulation versus market was a very good way to characterize this climate change issue. Because we're going to have some cases where we have command and control. You cannot do that. Some cases where we have taxes, which is a little bit of a market issue. Some places where we subsidize practices. Think about the $18 billion in an Inflation Recovery Act. That's probably going to go subsidize practices. Then we get tradable emission permits, emission reduction credits, some voluntary agreements, um, performance standards. Pro bans of particular products, direct R&D, subsidizing bioenergy, and enhancing markets for green products. There's ideas now that if you generate a low carbon footprint product, perhaps you can differentiate the price of that in the marketplace. So comments on strategies. Um, a lot of the USDA conservation programs are more aimed at sequestration. Unfortunately, sequestration strategies are only going to work for 20 years or so, and then we stop getting a gain from them. So there's really the issue that once you move that ecosystem to a new carbon equilibrium, how long are you going to get there before you kind of flatten out your gains? And then how do you maintain that stock after you stop paying for it, if you stop paying for it? How long are your contracts for? What's the liability if somebody goes to a, a reversal? There's general issues across all the things we can do in ag about how certain we are of their outcomes, how long will they last, do they stimulate leakage or indirect land use? Is this really something that's additional when we start paying farmers to do it? Are they really going to change their behavior? Or are we going to pay people to keep doing what they've already done? And then finally, transactions costs. There's like a 50% transactions cost when you're spending money in some of these programs. So that $18 billion may be matched by another $9 billion in additional funding that has to go into USDA offices. On bioenergy, <coughs> there's life cycle accounting. Unfortunately, at the moment, it's too expensive. Um, it, right at the moment, I think if you generate a gallon of cellulosic ethanol, you get like about a $2.50 sale value of it. And the government gives you another, I think the RIN is up around 3 bucks. So that means the production cost is like five fifty at the moment. Um, it's pretty expensive, land competition and indirect land use. So the grand challenge, I don't think any one policy approach is going to work. I don't think it's a markets or regulation. I think it's a whole spectrum of things. There was a guy when I was on the National Academy panel for limiting climate change 
who talked about the Robert Sokolow wedges. And what it basically was is there's no one silver bullet. There's you know, going to take 20 approaches to get to this. We will face demands, no doubt, for adaptation information and mitigation, as well as variabil variability reduction. Um, we're going to have to make efficient use of money because we're not going to find all that much. Even in the research space, we need to determine what's the public role and what's the private role. I mean, Cargill, or no, what's the one? Monsanto is going to develop drought resistant commodities, but they probably aren't going to do it for sweet sorghum. They'll probably do it for corn and wheat that have big markets. Um, and we need to be careful about additionality. Every, every farm group, like 20 years ago when I first started working on sequestration, said farmers should be paid to be good actors. Meaning if for the last five years they've been using no-till, and you come out to pay for no-till, that you should keep paying them for no-till. Well, that doesn't really generate additional carbon, but it does help preserve the stock that we have in the ground. It's a tricky issue, and there's many of them here. So with that, I'm probably over time, but I am. <laughs> It's lunchtime, but David needs to talk. <laughs> this was a, really an excellent presentation. I'm a little bit uh, more optimistic than Bruce and more pessimistic than Bruce. I think that uh, Bruce is one of the only economies that was really working with other disciplines for a long time. And uh, the one thing that I really keep me optimistic is the pandemic. When you see what, uh, when, when there is something that people believe is a problem, suddenly science can move very fast. I, I, I've been working with scientists and uh, plant biology, see what happened in medicine, what happened in every area and we really have a situation that all the ag, life sciences, the lead is, is totally moving on the other direction. And to me, we need to find that the economy is finding a way to really to develop all these things that people call climate smart agriculture. I'm responsible to a large extent to this term. And the idea is how to fight with climate change and increase productivity because the Europeans don't think about basically reducing growth. So to me, looking at this information is very important, but finding a way to work, in with, to work with the private sector and generate some sort of an element that would make a regulatory system that would allow things moving forward is a, huge, is a huge challenge. And I really don't know how we can contribute to this talent. I think that the, 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 fear, uh, the fear mongering that Rick is doing is really crucial. Because, and I think a lot of the work that uh, Bruce is doing is, is really crucial because other disciplines think that everything is okay. The only thing we have to worry is to, is to worry about uh, the environment. How to bring this gap is between what we really see, between what is feasible, and between what other disciplines think is very, really crucial because everyone else except us think that the only solution is ecological agriculture. So I think if you really realize that this is a problem, and I wish we, you start to say, what happens if we have ecological agriculture? What does it mean? To me, this is the biggest, that, this is the biggest uh, obstacle that we, have to, that we have to deal with. I don't know what you think about. Well, it's a little hard to see a question in that, but <clears throat> um, I, let me just say a couple of things. We probably need a good disaster. I mean, we, we probably need, you know, a huge knockdown of corn yields in the United States on top of this hottest year ever to really remobilize things. I know that w it, Bob can help me on this one, but we had... P.I. 
payment in kind program that in one year it moved more acreage in the United States between commodities than, than we had in Europe in total. Um, so the American farmer is very responsive and we in America seem to be quite responsive. We can develop vaccines quite quickly at the pandemic, although the damn things don't work after four years. Um, <laughs> I've had five of them and I still caught the son of a gun, but it only lasted a couple days. Um, <clears throat> so anyhow, I, I do think it, it's important for us to, to kind of take this in our teeth and say, to me, what this says to agriculture, this little picture here is, where's that pointer? Um, notice here, there's just no difference between these climate outcomes. It says in agriculture, we better be an adaptation organization for the next 25 years. We, yes, we can help contribute to mitigation, but it really doesn't start to have its impacts till we get out here somewhere Whereas in the short run, we need to figure out how to produce that food. Not only do we have to feed all those billion of people and have all those big demand bounds on how much it's going to be, but we really don't know what's going to happen to our productivity when we start getting quite a bit warmer in the Corn Belt and places like that. So that's my non-answer to your non-question. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, Al Mussel from the Canadian Agri Food Policy Institute. Uh, th thanks very much for a, a great talk in a morning full of great talks. Um, I guess one one thing that bothered me a little bit, you, you you know, you had a graph there of sort of the increased frequency of property losses and climate-related disasters, and and of course one of the things we can do is is bring in uh, enhanced insurance. Well, interestingly, uh, this week. I saw on the, it was on the Today Show, they were talking about some of the major insurance companies pulling out of California. And apparently there's a backdrop public insurance, like property insurance. Apparently there's a, a backdrop insurance that the government runs or something like that. But what it highlighted for me is when you deal with the range of crises that you're contemplating in your talk here, and I would say the same thing about, you know, a, a Tom Hurdle considered, I mean, one thing, kind of an insoluble problem, the phosphorus. The phosphorus loss is beyond the, the carrying capacity. We, we know that. Um, in, in Rich Sexton's talk, uh, uh, Rich didn't bring up renewable diesel. But again, th these are the magnitude of these things are, are shocking. I wonder how we avoid not just dealing with these as individual one-offs, but rather as kind of cascading <coughs> issues. Like, like surely to gosh, when we discover that uh, we have a phosphorus problem from both a pollution perspective and also a supply perspective from the standpoint that some of the places where phosphorus comes from are not necessarily friendly to the Western world. Um, how can we deal with these as one-offs rather than sort of they collide into one another? And the problem we thought we had is actually far worse than any one of these individual things. I guess we're missing the office of the chief economist that sets all U.S. policy that could come up and talk to us about how to do that. Um, Spiro could tell us how to analyze that. I mean, the, the big question here is, <clears throat> are we going to stop in the policy sphere some of the climate change avoidance? I mean, the, a meteorologist quit the other day out there in the middle of the country somewhere because people were calling him up and saying climate change doesn't exist. Why are you talking about it? And we, I went to testify before Congress a few years ago. Just about everybody on both sides said the climate is changing, but half of the people that I talked to said we don't have anything to do with it. Um, the adaptation is actually not a climate change policy. It's an agricultural policy we can pursue to produce better under this warming world, whatever is causing that warming. We don't necessarily have to get on top of, of saying th that U.S. agriculture, greenhouse gases are playing a role in future climate change. I don't quite know how we 
we have kind of a more collective response to a bunch of different things that are coming at us all at once, but we probably need to. I think the pandemic was a nice disaster that told us we had problems in our health systems, and I think we're probably fixing problems in the health system that weren't necessarily part of the pandemic, but overall contribute to overall public health. Beyond that, I can invite others to speak to how we, we learn to be more comprehensive in policy. But I, I must admit, um, nothing's better for changing the way we do things than a good disaster. So maybe we need a good disaster. Thank you very, very, very much. <laughs> Thank you.